or Mr. Adam Dagner here has rejoined me this week to con complete, <laughs> continue one of those two. Complete, hopefully, <laughs> our talk about chaos in the old world and beyond. Uh, we had some some technical issues getting started around time, but you know what? If you're watching this on YouTube or the podcast, it's all the same, right? It's all what, good. What's up with you? What's anything new with you, Mr. Dagna? Uh, not really. Um, pretty much all the same. But, uh, yeah, I had to do a factory reset on my computer this week, so I didn't miss the stream. Uh, but we're all back up and running, and yeah, all's good. Nice. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of a weird... Weird question to pose in the age of the pandemic, where it's like, what's new this week? And it's like, nothing. Everything's the same. <laughs> right. I haven't done Still anything. Home. Masks. Right? Uh, we have a weird thing coming up this this coming week. My, my son, who's almost three, his daycare had to close uh, last Friday. And then this whole upcoming week because of a case at the daycare. So it's like... Great. <laughs> Unfortunately, we we don't really have people around to like. Right. We, we, he doesn't have grandparents that that live around here or anything like that to help watch. So it's like, I guess me and Danny are taking turns taking the day mm. off to be home with the kid. So it's gonna be a weird week. <laughs> we were talking about workout schedules just before I came down to to do oh. this, and it was like I don't know. It's just, it's one week if things are aren't, aren't gonna work out perfectly. It's one week. Hopefully that that's it. <laughs> yeah, my girls actually, uh, my girls' school actually opened up for a hybrid schedule for the first time since. So they're they're back at school after spring break is over. Uh, have they been fully remote this whole time? Uh oh. Oh, he's back. You still with me, Adam? Yeah, they've been full full remote. Can you hear me? I can now, yeah. <laughs> now? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Little hiccup there. Uh, yeah, so they've been full remote for just over a year. And they just now went to... Uh, they'll be going Monday, Tuesday, and then off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Oh, wow. Oh. It's interesting. The more I talk to people with kids in schools, the more I realize how atypical uh, my school is, where I work. And we've been like full in person um, from the beginning. We Well, the first three weeks we took, we had Wednesdays as like a wellness Wednesday where uh, the students didn't have to report in. They just had to like check in online. And they weren't to get like new assignments and whatnot, just to help with like the stress of the the weirdness of everything. That lasted a whole three weeks, and since mm -hmm. then we've been full. In, we've had times where we had to go full remote or close here and there because of cases, of course. Um, but like the more people I talk to, the more I realize we're like it's the only school I know of from everybody I've talked to that that's been doing it that way. Um, like a day, not this past week, but the week before, we had a snow day. Uh, we had to use an emergency day because a staff member tested positive and they were doing contact tracing. So it was just like, everybody just take the day off, which was weird because before <laughs> then it would have been like remote. So I'm not sure why they, they did it that way, but it was like, I, they had a really, the, the day before that was, was rough. So I was happy with that day off, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's just, especially schools have been so weird. I hear, you know, I didn't real like how many schools out there different parts of the country have been doing things so differently even just well, my girls school it's a charter school okay they don't they haven't been doing the same the same as like the public schools have so a lot of the public schools have been back and off and on you know depending on what, what happens with outbreaks uh but my girl school has just been like you know what we'll get back when we can <laughs> and uh, I think because our governor just sort of removed restrictions and things. Okay, I think I caught most of that. You're, you're lagging a bit here. 
cutting out a little bit here and there. Uh, but Danny has a question from the chat. She said, does Arizona have anything like a snow day equivalent? Do you even know what a snow day is? <laughs> I've never personally had a snow day, and no, I mean, we just stay inside when it's hot. So... <laughs> oh, that's kind of sad. Or when I was um, first becoming a teacher, I was uh, a day-to-day -day substitute teacher for like a year and a half, and snow days were so bittersweet because it was like, oh, cool, I got the day off, but I, I also don't get paid because everything, of course, was per diem. Um, and then I got a long-term sub position for another year and a half and it was the same thing. Snow days I didn't get paid for cause I didn't work. And once I finally, you know, got a real salary teaching job, you know, snow days became the best thing ever again. Cause you don't have to work, but your salary, so you still get paid. Whee! <laughs> let me, let me see if it, this, this is just the base setting through discord. So let me see if that speeds up my lag i seem the video seems better, better already in terms of lagginess all right i was trying to go through the webcam software because it has a little bit better uh white balance and light and everything but i think it slows it down so anyway yeah, it seems smoother now great uh but yeah so i don't know what's gaming have you done any kind of gaming in the last week uh no, I've been kind of like reading more through the Iron Sworn rules, and, which is kind of a solo play role playing game with that uses like what they call oracles to uh, dictate sort of what happens in the story as you fail, succeed, or whatever in checks. And it's kind of cool. I, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, it it definitely like makes you flex your GM muscles because as, as you get results from the dice, you have to come up with you know, what, what does that mean? And what happens in the story because of that? So it sounds really yeah, neat. You guys of... have been all about it in the discord the last month or so. Uh, just the yeah. idea of a solo RPG sounds really interesting or like GM. You yeah, just it... play it GM list, right? Yeah, you can do, well, you can do it guided like with a group. So one player basically still acts as the, the GM, but you still like, um, roll against the oracle to kind of see what certain roles mean but then the gm interprets the oracle or you can do a totally co-op where the whole group decides what does that oracle mean and how does that affect the story or you can just play straight up solo with just one character and then you decide for yourself how that works so oh. it's really it, it's a lot very flexible and like i said it really makes you sort of uh learn improv i think i think that that's the biggest thing that i'm gonna take away from it in my in my group is how to how to sort of improv results from dice rolls um without just like a straight fail or succeed or whatever how do you you know sort of interpret a die roll to be more than just a success or failure cool that sounds interesting i might you guys have been talking about it for a while i haven't checked it out yet but i might need to i like that idea um, of practicing the dice roll type things the the rule set's free um, if you just want the PDF, uh, obviously through, uh, RP, uh, roll through, uh, drive through RPG, you can, uh, print on demand, but, uh, just the straight up rule sets free on the website and, uh, you know, you can pay what you want or whatever, but, uh, ultimately you can get it and try it for free. So I totally definitely recommend it. Very cool. And Hey, yeah. professional casual network, we have a drive through our drive through RPG affiliate link. Uh, right. make sure that it gets in the, the show notes for, um, the YouTube version and, and whatnot. Make sure we have that somewhere at least because for hey, sure help, you know, support the network a little bit. Uh, right. let's see my gaming. Unfortunately we had to, we were going to record, um, some more lost omens podcast, our pathfinder two actual play, um, on Friday the other day. I, but, um, because of things with my son's daycare and whatnot, we ended up having to cancel cause not everybody could make it which is why we record ahead a lot, so in case days like that happen, we, it's not that big of a deal. I think the last episode Danny edited is coming out in May. <laughs> so oh, wow. we're, we're good to go there. Um, but we changed things up a little bit for... Um, oh, yeah, the power phase for Marvel Crisis Protocol on Mondays. 
we were gonna play we're gonna start doing the the new league rules the infinity war league rules and run that mm. but we just kind of didn't have time to get that already and then they we, uh atomic mass games had a big like um online kind of like con it was a bunch of news and release and like previews and um painting tutorials and stuff it was really awesome and like the first thing they did for crisis protocol was release a new like a new little like mini campaign playing like civil war which sounds awesome mm. so we're going to be playing through those missions over the next few weeks on the stream uh, you know, right here at this twitch.tv slash professional casual network, 7 p.m. Eastern nice. on Mondays. And I'm going to play tomorrow against Tim. He's going um, registration team because he's totally Team Iron Man. And I'll be running um, the Renegades, as they're called, in in the, the mini campaign. And I'm, I tried to make as close as I could get to the airport fight scene from the Civil War movie. Uh, so I've got Cap, Hawkeye, Ant-Man... Winter Soldier. Unfortunately, they don't have a Falcon model for the game yet, so uh, I took Rocket Raccoon because I had two points left, and that's he fits in there. And I feel like he would be anti-registration anyway. I don't think he'd want to be on any registry list. It seems like he's kind of anti-establishment, so that's a good call. I feel like it fit. <laughs> so it's an interesting team for me to essentially take a team with almost no superpowers, like... Captain America's strong and tough. That's about it. Everybody else is basically a dude with technology. <laughs> hmm. That's interesting. I was, I was yeah. looking at the team and I was like, this seems underwhelming just because I don't really have any superpowers. It's weird. But we'll see how it goes. Hopefully I don't just get uh, thrashed again. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least this time. If you do lose, you can say, well, I wasn't really playing superheroes, so... <laughs> I had a bunch of dudes with bows and arrows and shields. Like, what do you expect? <laughs> right. Way to, way to handicap yourself there. Right, because Tim can take, like, Iron... If he if he does the same thing and do the airport scene, he can have Iron Man, uh, Vision, who's really good in the game, Black Panther, some kind of version of Black Widow, Spider-Man, like... Hmm. He, he will... I... Luckily, the game, of course, isn't balanced. That way we'll have the same amount of points, so, like... Just because he has more better characters. Oh, my heat is going crazy. That would be an interesting uh, scenario to run. Have both sides pick only superheroes without superpowers. I feel like there aren't as many in Marvel. Other than like Hawkeye, Black Widow. I mean Rocket. I guess you could count him as not having powers. Yeah. I mean you got. I guess you could. You might have to be a little more flexible with that. But. Uh... Yeah. But yeah. I'm looking I'm forward really sure. to that one. I think once Cable... Is Cable out? Not, no. Uh, he In America, he was delayed. He should be on the rest does of the he, world next month. Does he count as having superpowers? He's kind of more of a weapons and technology guy, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. He's an Omega-level mutant. He's super, super powerful. Oh, is he? I, I just seem to remember him being kind of more like a cybernetic thing, but that was... That was a comic my brother followed, not not one that I read a lot. So Yeah, in Deadpool 2, he didn't really, other than his cybernetic stuff. Uh, but yeah, in the comics, he's a, a Omega-level telepath and telekinetic. He's incredibly powerful, but he's kept in check okay. because of the techno-organic virus. I could do a whole, you know, especially <laughs> X-Men lore show. <laughs> sure. I don't want to get it's too much. It's been so many years since I really like kept up on the lore with the <laughs> comics. I, I was big into it in high school and then sort of fell off and haven't really gotten back into it so x-men have been my jam since but literally before i could read i had x-men comics <laughs> and i was i would ask like my cousin to read to me because i didn't know how to read yet I'd be like here read me that's this comic cool. book i want to know what's actually happening <laughs> uh, that's funny but before i get on too much of a tangent um right we should probably jump into the lore focus for this week we decided not to do another uh book recommendation this week because this is part two so right Let's talk about chaos. Last week we left off, we were talking about corn and all of his wrathful right. glory. So uh, I figure, I'm in my mind, I'm moving down the, the list of like who's the most powerful. Corn and Zinch typically are vying for that. Corn is generally considered more powerful because anytime there's bloodshed, it's whether they say it or not, it's really in Corn's name and the Warhammer world's full of war. So he's right. pretty much always well, at the top there. I think it seems to me that, that Zinch and Korn are more um, 
kind of in your face chaos, whereas Nurgle and Slanesh are sort of more subtle and in, in the background. So they're not, you know, Slanesh is more about like kind of secret cults and, and, you know, obviously Nurgle's quite a bit more uh, noticeable with his mutations and diseases and stuff. So like you can be a, a follower of Corn, and as long as you don't have like massive mutations physically, you can pretty much fit in. And same with Zinch. You know, you, you can kind of walk around more, but, you know, followers of Nurgle and and things obviously have more trouble. And, and then Slanesh seems to be more inclined to be secretive. So I, I think they're just more overt rather than more powerful in my mind. Yeah, fair. Yes, I was going to move on to Zinch to start today, in my mind at least, as number two. Okay. Um, so, Zinch is our chaos god of change and magic, and uh, he's usually depicted, the, the avian themes run heavy with Zinch stuff, a lot of uh, bird faces and feathered wings and whatnot. Um, he's often associated with the color pink, pink and blues, usually, uh, and he is, yeah, he, the god of magic, essentially. Um, Bastion says the one true god in the chat. <laughs> uh, we were talking after the the stream last week in the Discord of like um, if we were to get like four people on the stream to talk about like each represent a different god. And I was like, I'll take Corn because he's my favorite. And last week you said yours was Nurgle, and Bastion yeah, said he would be Zinch. And Taylor, our, our uh, Throw Lash Gaming, there um, is all about Slanesh. He loves Slanesh, so it was like easy right. peasy done. <laughs> done. Uh, Zinch, uh, Zinch is interesting, probably the most, um, nuanced of the different gods, just because, uh, Zinch cults run rampant in, in some cases throughout the Empire, especially for, like, uh, for, uh, Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, it seems like every third adventure there's a Zinch cult that you're trying to stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And the thing I love about Zinch is the whole idea, like, it's all part of the plan, he is the the master machinator. Is that how you say that word? <laughs> he, he um, like Goodness. master of machinations. Is that more mm. correct? I think machinations. Maybe. I don't know how to say it. Um, he's also the master. Uh, uh, oh shoot! I lost the word. Now I was gonna make a joke. Masticator. <laughs> and choose things all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like he he's the one that plans plans on plans on plans he's got you know it plans a b c all the way through um and whenever one thing falls apart as it inevitably does he's got backup plans to do that too and i love that about zinch cults where they will work in the shadows because they have all these little intricate plans and as pieces fall into place uh then then zinch is happy mm -hmm. which well, kind of it seems like it seems like he's more really just kind of change for change's sake, you know? Yes. It, it's a lot easier for, I think, those cults because all they want is for stuff to change, you know? And so multiple cults can be working simultaneously for different things. And as long as any of them are successful, Zinch is happy, so. Right. I love that idea that there are all these different cults that are dedicated to Zinch, and they often are completely at odds with each other as well. As we see a lot mm -hmm. in fourth edition Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, you've got the Purple Hand is kind of the main, one of the bigger Zinch cults. Got their little icon here on the video, which is literally just that typically they'll paint their hand purple and then they'll they'll stick it on things. Uh, they will typically have a, a tattoo of a purple hand somewhere on their body, hidden, of course, um, but they almost will never work with other cults of Zinch, like the Red Crown or the Jade Scepter, that usually completely at odds with each other and will will do what they can to, to ruin other people's plans, even if they mm -hmm. are also meant to be, like, furthering the power of Zinch. <laughs> sure. Well, it seems like they each have their own agenda, and each one's agenda sort of doesn't jive with each other's, so then they end up opposing each other, trying to achieve their own goal. Yes, exactly. It's that that common motif in in the Warhammer stuff where like these groups would be able to really affect change and and take over areas if they weren't constantly infighting. 
Mm-hmm. Like if the chaos yeah, it's like gods, the, it's like the orcs. It's you know, if, if at any point all the chaos gods decided that they were on it to get serious and join forces, it'd be over. You know, the only thing that stands between humanity and total obliteration is is chaos. <laughs> right. The fact that due to their nature, they are they are always at war with each other. Even oh no, Bastion mm-hmm. in the chat says that Jade Scepter is Slanesh. My bad. Okay. Uh, I just think it's funny that so many cults in the Warhammer world are like color object. Like, right. can you come up like, uh, I feel like there was like the, the Scarlet Skull or something like that. There was a cult, there was a corn cult you deal with in um, second edition of WFRP where you're in Middenheim um, in um, the, the Paths of the Damned campaign. It started with Ashes in Middenheim and you were against mm-hmm. a corn cult. And I feel like they were like, the bronze skulls or something like that. Another color mm-hmm. object like classic soup, like golden age superheroes, crimson skull. Thank you, Bastion. Right. Color object. <laughs> sure. Well, it seems like each of the gods is very particular about, um, you know, colors and, and iconography. So I, I guess that kind of makes sense for sure. Yeah. If it's anything to do with like, uh, red, uh, or, or like gold or bronze type colors it's going to mm-hmm. be corn of course if it's like purple well no that gets where it gets weird like purple hand purple i think slanesh is more right, commonly think, associated with i think truly purple is more slanesh but it's also seems to be a lot of zinch as well and they have a little bit of crossover kinda, there yeah and it depends what what universe you're talking about is it warhammer fantasy or is it 40k where pink is mostly slanesh with like emperor's children um, cover their armor in pink motifs sure. so well, it, and then zinch has it's you know pink horrors and things so it seems like like zinch and slanesh kind of cross over with their their colors a lot yeah and then good old nurgle is just like there with his greens and browns but then there's a slash cult called the Jade Scepter, and Jade is obviously green, so it's like, right? Yeah, you know, chaos. <laughs> they do whatever they want. <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, it's a it's a brighter, you know, green. Nurgle's more of like olive, and you know, the decay type colors, browns and dark, dirty greens and things. Let's see. Bastion says purple dye is the most expensive, so the hand took that color to represent their majesty. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, because yeah, purple purple pigments are historically, you know, in our world and the Warhammer world, expensive to get. They're hard to, to create purple pigments of things, so usually it's safe for royalty. So that makes sense. He said, and they go for after the higher powers. They typically are um, targeting those on higher ranks of society, which is which mm-hmm. is cool. Makes a lot of sense there. Uh, I don't know. Zinch has always been cool. I've always da- like I've dabbled with Zinch in, in my different cha- uh, chaos armies and things throughout the years, but he's never been like my favorite. Um, I've had some mm-hmm. different Zinch demon models, but I've pretty much all sold them all to one person. <laughs> he keeps buying I them. Th- I think for me, Zinch would kind of fall into number two. I, I do like Zinch, but um. Yeah, he's it's never really like taken top priority for me, like like you said. Yeah, he's cool, but he's not corn. Right. <laughs> he doesn't have right. giant rhinoceros, my mechanical rhinoceroses. <laughs> Bastion says heresy. It's, it's the nature of chaos. You gotta, you know, you pick one, you stick to it with your guns, and then you fight anybody that doesn't agree with you because that's chaos. <laughs> What's well, that's the beauty of chaos is it seems like no matter who you're talking to, they definitely have there's. I've never met somebody who was like, oh, yeah, I kind of like them all. They, right, that's, no, that's not okay. Everybody always has a tendency to really kind of like move into one of the gods and, and that's the one for them. Mm-hmm. You know? and, that, and that kind of falls into the lore as well. And like each person has a chaos god that sort of speaks to them and mm-hmm. like lures them and it's – it doesn't seem like there's very many op- opportunities where it's like multiple follower, you know, follower of multiple gods. Maybe in Norska, where they kind of like are closer to chaos and they sort of accept them more. But yeah, um, sometimes they worship like chaos undivided, where they just worship the powers of chaos in general, uh, which is sure. a kind of a cool idea. But I know the chaos gods themselves don't like that. They're like, no, we want your worship because that's what gives them power. 
the belief mm-hmm. in that God. So, yeah, it's something I've been trying to weave into a Grim Podcast or Perilous Adventure a little bit, where, in my mind at least, Mina, Bruno, and Lucky, all they are they all have caught the eye of a different Chaos God. Mm-hmm. Carl, at this point, he's... <laughs> He's still too good. <laughs> yeah. He hasn't. It seems like, like Carl is still like wrestling with several of them. Like his, uh, his personality could go sort of in a couple of different ways if, if he was to really embrace, but he, he's like, like you said, his inherent goodness sort of keeps him from really embracing any one mm-hmm. vice or, or whatever. And it's not that I, I don't feel like any of the characters are like, I'm not saying that they're secretly cultists or anything like that. It's just they've kind of caught the eye of different chaos gods, those different powers because of their actions and things that they're doing. But most of the, like, they don't think, like, the characters themselves don't think they're doing that sure. for the chaos gods or anything like that. So um, I have certain tables I roll on. Uh, if characters get mutations, I have that planned in my head. Mm-hmm. Like, because um, I think it was the... Uh, Enemy in Shadows Companion has expanded mutation tables, mm. which is really cool. Right. And they have specific, like you can roll on this specific god that reduces some possible uh, results and increases the chances of others. So, like Mina, Bruno, and, and Lucky, I have certain gods that I would roll on for them if they are to get mutations. Um, I mm-hmm. don't want to, I'm just trying to speak as spoiler free as possible. <laughs> but Carl, right. if you were to ever get mutated at this point, I feel like. I would just roll on a general table because he just doesn't really, he hasn't caught anybody's maybe, eye yet. Maybe roll on a table that is more associated with the moment of like the circumstance of where he got that mm, mutation. That's fair. Like that's if a it's good more, idea. if it's more like wrath based, like combat, then maybe you go to corn because you know, it seems like he could go a couple different ways. So that'd that makes sense. Interesting. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else about Zinch. I think future episodes I'll go more into detail about their different demons and and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, but for now, we'll just kind of cover cover the the basics. <laughs> Bastion just said Carl is the ever chosen. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be the end of the campaign. He'll just move. He'll just go to the chaos waste to to seek the crown of dominion. No crown of <laughs> domination. <laughs> Have Bellacor put it on right. his head. Uh, or he could always become a, you know a. Uh, Sigmar or something, he could go the other way and you know, like really embody one of the the law or you know good gods. That would be interesting too. Right? Yeah. I mean, he's we we joke around about how he's like the lawful good paladin of the group. So yeah, mm-hmm. he I I'd love to see him become like a like an avatar of Manan since that's his that's his main mm-hmm. god there. So like, sure, <laughs> he'd be like uh the new Aquaman of the of the gang. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about your most favorite, Papa, Papa Nurgle. Nurgle. Papa yeah. Nurgle. So Nurgle's one that, it, when when I first started playing Chaos stuff, he didn't really jive with me too much. I think I got some Nurglings way back in the day. I have some metal Nurglings and whatnot. Um, but it was just kind of like, ah, you just slap a bunch of green paint on him and you're good to go. So it was kind of boring to me. As they developed it more mm-hmm. in the different games, it got way more interesting. So now... Half my demons, I have half corn, half Nurgle. Um, and they just, I, I don't know. I like Nurgle more and more all the time. When I read more about where it wasn't just about disease, it got more interesting right. for me. Where Nurgle sure. actually wants to um, embrace new life and new growth, I thought, added a, a new layer to Nurgle to me that made it more interesting. Sure. Well, and it's also... To me, it's it's interesting because it's not just like with with Corrin, he's just about violence and wrath for the sake of it, and mm-hmm. Nurgle's not really about disease and decay for the sake of disease and decay. It's for it's to more of a nurturing kind of thing where he gives you Nurgle's rot so that you can't get any other disease and be, <laughs> and suffer from any other disease, and so like Nurgle's rot sort of is the, like inoculates you. And you don't feel pain from Nurgle's route. It, it spreads it to other people, but you know it's kind of his uh, his mercy, if you will. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and it, all a lot of his diseases 
aren't meant to kill unless it's something used in in war but it actually extends the life of, right. of those uh, afflicted in a lot of cases because the the disease just like props them up for a while it's like almost like undead in a way that mm-hmm. they're like diseased zombies instead of undead zombies <laughs> sure but that's what i mean with, with nurgle's rod it's like yeah you're infected with nurgle's rod but nurgle's rod doesn't it won't really kill you as long as you're you know uh, a cultist of nurgle it, at that point it more or less prevents you from getting any other kind of disease because there's nothing worse than nurgle's rod right so uh, unless you don't accept you know his grace and mercy uh nurgle's rod won't kill you it'll just kind of make you immune to everything whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger right right exactly nurgle's all about giving whether you want it I, or not. It seems like a lot of people turn to Nurgle, you know, as a way out from another like horrible disease. You know, if you had uh, something else that was going to kill you, then you would embrace Nurgle. And, and then, you know, this Nurgle's rot would kind of take over and you'd become immune to this other thing and you'd live on, you know, with the Nurgle's blessing. Mm, I love it. I love the, the fly motif in Nurgle stuff with like maggots and flies mm-hmm. everywhere and the plague drones riding giant rot flies. I think that's what they're called. Rot flies or, or something. Yeah. Uh, with the plague bearers just riding these giant flies. <laughs> I love those models and the, the look of it is just super cool. Um, I, without, hopefully it's not too much of a spoiler, but in the, the upcoming Settling the Southlands campaign, there are a couple of the NPCs that are, are kind of, you know, have some dealings either purposeful or not with the chaos gods and there's one that uh, i don't want to give away too much there but um i love the idea of nurgle with the whole idea of of embracing more life and whatnot so things like fungus is often associated with nurgle as well because fungi typically feed off of dead things or Mm -hmm. or they will grow on something that's alive and feeding off the life force of that essentially um, and I love that imagery with Nurgle stuff. I think that's relatively new, having like fungus all over the place because people generally think of fungus as like, oh, that's gross, or like they can cause diseases in people. Things like athlete's foot, people often don't realize is a fungus. Right. Because <laughs> not every fungus is just a mushroom or a toadstool. Sure. Well, it's like like most of the, what we consider to be pests or problems in some way, shape or form have something to do with decomposition or mm. composting or, you know, you know, worms and roaches and all these things are, are, are great decomposers and, and kind of actually bring more, more life than disease, you know, so to speak. So. Right. And that, that fosters the whole Papa Nurgo thing where decomposition, like you're saying, leads to more life. So he's just fostering more life. It's just not the right. life that humans want. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Bastion's trying to uh, spew some inflammatory comments here. He says, Nurgle is just a lesser aspect of the horned rat. We'll have to agree to disagree on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I know he's just trying to get a rise out of Adam because that's what you guys do. Oh, yeah. But um, I was actually going to talk about the, like, deriv- like the derived gods from the Chaos Gods at the end. Um, so we'll get back to the horned rat. Um, but Nurgle, I love that I found some images when I was looking for things to put on the video of Nurgle's stuff. And I, there was these awesome images of what I think is supposed to be Nurgle himself, um, like looming over a cauldron where he's just like stirring a cauldron that's bubbling Mm -hmm. and like tentacles are coming out and this weird stuff. And they're these great pictures, but I couldn't find sources for the artist. So I didn't want to use that and not be able to give proper, Mm -hmm. uh, proper credit so the what? images i've been using are just things from like warhammer army books which um, there's that there's that 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 concept with nurgle of like he's constantly creating yes and so that that cauldron is like where he kind of like brews new diseases and new new pestilence or whatever and so he's constantly working on his recipes if you will and creating you know new versions so that's that's that cauldron is kind of like iconography of uh, of that creation of disease of Nurgle, so yeah, I love it. He's like infinite, cre- infinitely creative with diseases, whereas I feel mm-hmm. like Zinch is infinitely creative with his over complex plans to take over the world, kind of thing <laughs> that never sure. seemed to work yeah. out. 
But Nurgle's yeah. diseases are certainly effective and potent. Sure. Well, they, they don't really rely on people people's acceptance of it. They, they sort of impose themselves on people in a way. Yeah, he's not, Nurgle's not real big with consent. He's not good at that. Yeah. Well, you'll give consent to, to keep from dying, basically. So he just gives it to you in advance and then waits for your consent. <laughs> I can <laughs> save you from this disease I gave you if you give me your soul. <laughs> right? And then you can become a plague bearer after you die. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, they're nasty, rotten sword, or um, rusty swords. They were really oh, fun yeah. to paint. I love painting the the plague swords. I think they're sim- they're called. Yeah, all the everything that looks like it's just like it would be totally ineffective because it's rusted and pitted and whatever. But they're like you know, demon and imbued weapons and whatnot. So right, it's a demon weapon, so it's just magic anyway. <laughs> so right. it's, it might look nasty, but it's not going to break anytime soon. <laughs> right, exactly. All right, let's talk about uh, the Dark Prince, the final of the four main. Uh, Slanesh here, mm. our good buddy Taylor, friend of the network, uh, his favorite. Um, Slanesh is really cool. I, I, I've, I've never been a fan of Slanesh in the the battle the war, uh, fantasy battle games, just because for the longest time Slanesh had the fewest options because it was the newest, and they just didn't seem to know what to do with Slanesh. It was like you had demonettes, which were like supposed to be kind of sexy lady demons. Right. Um, the older models were, you know, made in like the 90s. So it was like they were basically just naked ladies with crab claws. <laughs> so. Right. Well, it was like it was basically like half and half. So like half like kind of divided, you know, down the middle. You'd mm-hmm. have half female, half male. And then like these weird funky like crab or lobster claw you know, things going on. And I think it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing to sell to like parents, I think. Yeah. And that's why Slanesh has always been, had a hard time like gaining traction uh, because, you know, what parent wants their kid collecting an army of like, you know, demonettes with, you know, one breast exposed or whatever that they have to paint. Or bat or further so back, sort of, both. Just yeah, naked. Yeah, yeah. Which, Just you know, that was a I... big thing with wargaming and fantasy stuff in general was like, if there was a, a woman depicted in some way, they had their boobs hanging out, which was like, mm-hmm. well, I think the main reason why these hobbies are so dominated by males where women were like, well, the only way I'm represented is objectified. So why would right. I be interested in this? Which luckily across the board, things have gotten so much better with that, even with things like demonettes they um kept the whole bare chest or part of the bare chest but like demoness became more androgynous or even hermaphroditic mm-hmm. where they were clearly meant to have um aspects of both male and female so like they would have one breast but it, that part would be covered and the other half of their chest would be uncovered and it was more like a male chest like you know just pectoral sure. muscle kind of thing and i feel like it, that that's... went a long way in allowing more people to feel Right. Rep, you know, not not represented in a, in a in one way in the game. I think it, it made it more like acceptable to have it be part of the game. But I think in a lot of ways, it sort of deviates from, you know, what Slanesh really is all about. Like, I think the original um, models and pictures and painting and whatever of Slanesh kind of seem to embody the god better. Like, it's more just truly about you know, pleasure and excess and flesh and, and covering that up while it makes it more palatable. And like, from a commercial standpoint, I think it does kind of deviate a little bit from what the God is truly about. Right. Makes sense. Well, that's in my games and and my like under, um, I mean, not understanding, but like the way I choose to interpret Slanesh is that it's more about excess in all things. And like Mm -hmm. the excess, like when people talk about Slash, the first thing they always talk about is orgies. And it's like, that's right. one part, sure, yes. Sure. Excess of sex, certainly. That's something, especially humans, that's something people can sure, really latch sure. on to. But to me, it's also excess, like, um, you know, just like gluttony, to me, is a very sure. slanishy thing. This excess, just eating food when you don't need to, or eating too, mm-hmm. you know, just constantly kind of thing. Too um, much. Anytime, to me, in the Warhammer world, anytime somebody gets obsessed with something, 
that is their inadvertent or or over uh mm-hmm. worship of slanesh um so like i feel like personally like for me dan the gm i would be um more drawn like per- towards slanesh just because when i get into something i really get into something as you can probably sure. tell by the the shelves behind me <laughs> sure and it's just yeah, like no, I, I, I can definitely see that uh and it seems like, you know, with Slanesh, it's, it is more about basically excess of pleasure, whatever mm-hmm. that happens to be. There's, there's certain people who are into pain, you know, a pain is pleasure. And so right. there's that aspect. And then there's, you know, the uh, kind of the food and, and that, that sort of excess of pleasure. And then there's, there is always like the sex and the, you know, the orgy base. It's like all things that can bring pleasure. Mm. is done to excess and that is slanesh slanesh would love rock and roll <laughs> sex drugs and rock sure. and roll that's that's the yeah. slanesh and that's a lot of yeah, like dr- yeah i don't want to talk about 40k too much on this stream but that's a big part of slanesh and 40k like they have noise marines like creating sound mm-hmm. that can be pleasurable or painful that is like the idea uh bastion just said they also rebranded slanesh away from deviance and stuff into the god of obsession and excess I like that idea better. I think there's more you can do with that in the setting, especially with the role playing. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't have to be about sex. It can just be about too much of whatever sure. that 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 gives you pleasure. Like um you're saying something I had I had a point to kind of uh piggyback on what you were saying and then I lost it. <laughs> oh, Slanesh sure. would love today's world of like obsessive video gaming where people Mm -hmm. what was it um i think when skyrim came out there were people that died because they would not stop playing to even use the bathroom and poison themselves because they were uh, just like world of warcraft also had that problem right like i don't think it's in, in in huge amounts but like here and there it happens because people just will not stop playing because they're completely obsessed with it and that to me that is slanesh to a t you can't do anything else except for this one thing that right. you are completely obsessed with, um, which I like well, that it's, rebranding it's, a lot. It's also, you know, the people who, uh, you know, know that they're killing themselves, can't fit through their front door, but will still, you know, order a bucket of fried chicken. Or, you know, <laughs> they, they know what they're doing is is in excess, but, you know, it, it's so ingrained in their their you know, mentality or whatever that they can't break away from it. It's, it becomes an obsession. And, you know, right. I think that that all sort of feeds into so I, I feel like our modern day has a lot of slanesh in it i think so. in our world slanesh would be the most powerful god by a lot mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> thank goodness sure. we don't have chaos gods <laughs> let's see right? bastion says maybe but zinch created those games in the first place that's a good point because zinch is all about the great game which by the way you just lost the game sorry it made you think uh, about it. <laughs> that's Bastion's fault. He brought up the word game. Uh, but I like that idea. And that's that whole like vying for power between the Chaos Gods. Zinch may have created these games in the first place, but Slanesh has twisted them into like worshipping them instead. Right. Which I think is just well, cool. They also sort of play off of each other a little bit, you know, with whenever corn goes in and and slaughters, you know, a whole village, well now there becomes you know, a, a case of all those bodies now start to decay and that gives power to Nurgle, you know. So you know, they sort of all play off of each other a little bit, which is kind of all strengthens each other right. in the same process. I like how they GW has done this over the years where they've really solidified these relationships between the gods and like how you just, like how they're kind of um, symbiotically connected with mm-hmm. each other. Yeah. It's, it's kind of an interesting... They're, they're opposed to each other, and yet they're symbiotic as well, to some degree. <laughs> Taylor just popped on the chat and said, I heard there was Slanesh. I came as soon as I could. <laughs> and then he said, giggity. <laughs> uh, thank you, Taylor. That was great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Slanesh... Is, I think Slanesh is my favorite for uh, for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay just because of what you can do to characters 
in a way, in the name of Slanesh. Like we said a lot of the published mm-hmm. stuff has to do with Zinch that I've read at least so far. Um, I purposely haven't read a lot of the adventures outside of the enemy within, just in case someday we decide to do other shows where I'm not GMing. I don't want to know what all the adventures are going to be ahead of time because that's just not as fun. You know, finding out as you're playing is so right. much better. But you know, including more things with Slanesh, I think is really cool to play up those other excesses and. Um, uh, without spoiling too much, we will have some of that in Settling the Southlands, which, you know, I just can't wait for to, to be released. <laughs> I gotta get the okay from Tim to, to announce the release date, but it's uh, coming up soon. I think there was, it was originally a third edition adventure. I think maybe even their starter Nobody uh, talks about adventure. Third that's been converted over, and that had uh, to do with the Von Bruners and the Slanesh cult. So, oh, nice. Uh, yeah. yeah, if somebody else wants to do that work and convert their, I've heard the third event, third edition adventures were were not bad. Except there was one called The Enemy Within that was not The Enemy Within, and that just seems heresy. Yeah. Uh, other than the game rules themselves, it seemed like everything else about third edition was good. Like, the artwork from it seems solid, and I've heard the adventures mm-hmm. were good, but it didn't last long because they were like, well, we're going to take this game that people have loved for 30 years and just completely make it from the ground up and throw out everything yeah. everybody loved it about was... WFRP. Like, I never even... I've been, I didn't buy a single thing for 3rd Edition, and I absolutely adored 2nd. That's when I started playing. Uh, was right sure. when 2nd Edition came out. I'm a little, you know, kind of missed the boat on 1st Edition. And... Like third edition, I wouldn't touch with a ten foot pole. Where it was, like, right. I, I was excited for it. I, I I didn't mind the idea. It was like, okay, Fantasy Flight Games has it. They they've got a good pedigree. But the the core set was a hundred bucks. Yeah. Well, whenever it came out, ten plus years ago, a hundred dollars, and there was no other way to buy it other than this core box of three books. And it was like, I don't want that. I just want. Like the player's handbook equivalent. Why do? You, why are you trying to sell me all these other books I don't want together? Like, at least sell them separate. So if I like right. the one, I can get the others. It it was the dumbest way to do it that I've ever seen. And to get like what we have now, I'm glad it failed. So we could get um fourth edition. Oh no, I think my Discord just cut out. I forgot it does that about every forty five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> all right there we go that should be back okay we got it back there we go uh whoops um <laughs> throw lash says yeah it doesn't sound like gw at all this <laughs> is sorry take talking about toxicity uh last stream of mine don't be toxic throw lash yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that could be a whole topic of to- the, the toxicity especially of like wargaming groups for whatever reason the discord yesterday we were talking about the um the the short lifespan of the unofficial warframe rpg where mm-hmm. two hours into the kickstarter for this thing that was completely legal um the the community freaked out about the guy making it so much that he like spent a day in panic attacks and just canceled it straight out which really is too bad because he had hired people to work with like editing with him and the artwork and the kickstarter was basically to recoup that money and then stretch yeah. goals were like to add more and it just the community killed it because people are just. Well, it's it, it definitely is like one of those things where if you love something and, and a, you know, an IP of some kind and then, you know, somebody's you, if you see somebody as like infringing upon it or, or whatever, you know, um, then you kind of like feel like you need to defend the, the your, your IP or whatever. When in reality, there, there's room for people to to you know do things that are tangentially related without like completely stealing it you know and, and pay homage to and not in it but unfortunately people right. don't really see that well, it was interesting because yeah. as i was reading the article about this so um i think i think it's a free game on consoles and pc uh i i think i played it very briefly warframe uh where very popular game because i'm pretty sure it's free to play and um this guy wanted to make an rpg of it using the system he had built for a different game 
And so he did a Kickstarter to, like I said, to recoup the cost of things like artists and whatnot. And he was just bombarded with essentially harassment about stealing from this company, um, stealing their IP. And it was like fragrant, not fragrant, flagrant, flagrant, (laughs) flagrant IP theft and whatnot, where in the copyright laws, he was doing it. uh, As I was reading it, I was like, okay, yeah, I can kind of see these people's point. It sounds like. IP theft, and then as I read through it, actually read the article and and finished the article, everything he was doing was completely legal within copyright laws. Sure. So it was like all these people were freaking out on this guy that didn't do their homework. They, it was you know typical right. thing we have anymore. People just read the highlight, or read the headline, and assumed they knew what was going on where they these people didn't and. I don't know what it is, especially about like nerd and and wargaming communities in particular. People are awful about that kind of stuff. Yeah, they are. Which I just and, I don't. And get. even even in among like additions, I mean, you look in the D and D community, or even in the Warhammer community, like there's people oh. that are diehard second edition, hate fourth edition, like only first edition, whatever you know. And right, you know, we... anybody else who disagrees is wrong, you know. Right. Like, so, I was just talking it, crap about third edition of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which I, I have my reasons. I've never actually played it, so I probably shouldn't be talking so much smack on it. But like, right. I, Brashen brought it up in the in the the chat a second ago. He said he needed all the special boards and little tokens and whatnot. Or if you see pictures of tables of people playing Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay third edition, it doesn't look like a role playing game at all. It looks like a board game. Like there are so many cards yeah. and tokens and and blah blah blah, which is like I just want to. I just want to role play and roll dice. Like, why is there so much stuff right. with it? But you from know, from what I've heard in the interviews and from other people in the community, you know, third edition actually is like a very elegantly developed game, and it's like a lot of it's a lot of fun to play. From what I understand, uh, it just was too different. It just it, it missed the mark in terms of the community, what the community wanted. Right. To if me, it had been a different game, you know. Right, like they use a lot of those principles from that game for the Star Wars RPGs, and I think those are great with those um, those different dice that can help determine the the levels of success somebody gets. Uh, I think that's a cool concept, and I like that a lot. I think the Star Wars RPGs that Fantasy Flight Games makes are great, but with Warhammer, it has a lot of what GW did with Age of Sigmar, where it was like, all right, we're going to destroy everything you love about this and just make it our own instead. Which was like, sure, you can't do that with an old IP like that. Like Fantasy Flight Games, sure. If you had made like, if you had continued with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Second Edition and made like a different Warhammer game using those rules they came up with for Third, I feel like that would have been much more accepted by the community. Right. But when they were like, okay, we have two editions of this game that people love, we're gonna throw out basically everything. And come up with something completely different that works in a totally different way with proprietary dice and cards and tokens and all this stuff. It was just too much for the community. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, no, I don't yeah. want to do that. Like, I I can't use anything from my previous collection at all. Like, I can't even, like, to convert things from 1st and 2nd edition to 3rd edition was not impossible, but it was a, a complete rework. It was just people were like, no. But even Thrillash yeah. says Edge of the Empire was boss. Like when they use those same concepts for a different game instead of throw, you know, starting from scratch, or starting from really starting from scratch sure. instead of throwing out previous things, it was much much more well received. Sure. Yeah. Well, and I think that with Warhammer, it was way too ingrained that it should be a D one hundred system. Right. You know, with with you know skills and attributes and all that, like you know, being applied to this percentile system. You know. It, Whereas, like, Star Wars didn't... I mean, they had, like, a D6 version and a D20 version. It never really had, like, a true, like, his, history of, of a certain system right. being Star Wars. So when Fantasy Flight did their version of Star Wars, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of pushback because, you know, there wasn't a, an established community around a certain, you know, system uh, where like there was with Warhammer. Right. So, thank goodness Cubicle 7... Started up fourth edition, and so I think it's great. Obviously, it's not perfect. No system is perfect. It has little flaws here and there, but overall, it is fantastic. Uh, Bastion sure. brings up a good point in the chat. He says it was the time of D and D fourth edition too. So 
it was all the rage just starting things over from scratch <laughs> uh, sure. and and people not liking it which i think has led directly to the the success of pathfinder as its own corner of the uh our you know tabletop rpg market mm -hmm. but even you know the the 3.5 pathfinder people are like very vehemently opposed to the second edition in a lot of cases so i mean every time there's a new edition there's going to be a group of people that can that are you know very against it so oh totally yeah i mean edition wars i it drives me i like i i was just engaging in it a moment ago but it, it's one of those things that drives me crazy in facebook groups where like you know i'm in D D fifth edition groups just because i haven't left yet even though we haven't played D D in like over a year now because of the pandemic but like i'm in pathfinder 2 groups and wfrp groups of course and i interesting to me the warhammer fantasy roleplay groups are the least toxic by far by far people are super supportive there they, we don't really get into edition wars because i think partly because it's generally accepted that you just don't talk about third edition because it wasn't the same game and like right. some people there's once in a while there's a little back and forth like was it second edition or fourth edition the best one blah 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 but mm -hmm. like it seems like every third post in in the pathfinder group is what's better pathfinder 2 or dnd 5e and it's like who cares just play what you like right. like why does it matter they're they're different games <laughs> right Stop it. Well, even there was there was a post i think just yesterday of somebody saying oh, i just took alignments out of second edition what do you like what do you think it's like well it's too embedded. Like, just play a different game that doesn't have alignments. But at like, the same time, it's um, your game. Do what you want. If you don't want alignments, sure. sure. I mean, the yeah, do it if you want. But to me, alignments are there just to help foster role play. To think, how would my character react to the situation? Because blah blah blah. Like in our Pathfinder Two uh, actual play, the Lost Omens podcast, I play Brennan, who's a rat folk investigator, and he's just neutral. So my thing is. How would he react as a neutral character? Like, he's not inherently good because his whole thing is he wants to uncover the truth about whatever he can as an investigator. So, like, kind of like whatever means mm -hmm. necessary is how he reacts to things. Right. Do I need the alignment I, system I think... for that role play? No, but it, it helps to, when I was making the character, to decide what route he's going to take in certain situations. I think, unfortunately, with Pathfinder and D&D in particular... Alignment is is so baked into the entire system mm -hmm. that you really can't remove it without like really seriously affecting magic, without seriously affecting class abilities. I mean, the, the paladin or the champion, as you know, as they're called now. Oh man, I mean, don't get people started direct, on that change, right? But it's directly <laughs> tied into alignment. So, like, how, how do you have a champion without alignment? How do you have you know detect good or detect evil or you know protection from good and you know there's so many things that are like hard baked into the system relating to alignment that you're, you're basically writing a whole new game at that point. Right. Yeah. Fair. Um, there's some good points in the chat. Uh, Taylor says uh, it's kind of like the, the argument of which chaos God is better in terms of like addition wars. Uh, and he followed up with parentheses. Also the answer is obviously Slanesh. And then Bastion says, obviously it's Zinch. <laughs> Uh, and he also Clearly says, it's Nurgle. But... Right, obviously it's Corn. He's the best. So I, the, the four of us are here. We could argue about this for, you know, <laughs> ever uh, until the Chaos Realm consumes our planet. Uh, but he has a good other good point here. He says that all, all those games are great. It's just, you know, in their own right. He says, I just think the one is more fun. He says, I think this one is more fun in lore or on the table than you do. And it's all it all comes down to opinion. There are people that still play, you know, a D and D or even the original D and D kind of stuff. Like play what you want. Why do you care what other people play? Like after exactly. like we, I right. got back into role playing with using three five or, or fifth edition D and D because D and D was you know the original, and I wanted to play something that was easy for, to get people into the game because I our group at the time was a lot of newish people. Um, or the people that were already playing D and D and then quickly turned into, well, pandemic ended that game I was playing, um, because we're playing in person and whatnot. And then it was like, okay, well, Warhammer fantasy has been my game since 2005. So like, I want to get back into that. And it was like, well, fourth edition is here. It seems really good. seems back to what I liked about Warhammer 
So let's do that instead. And then, you know, we play Pathfinder 2nd Edition as well. And that's like, that's all I play now is those two games. And cool. I'm good with that. Right. I got these D&D books here. They don't see a lot of use anymore, but maybe again someday. Like, I'm not going to say I'll never play D&D again because it's not as good. Like, I don't care. It's a different game. It plays differently. Right. At this point, it's almost like a point of pride. Like, I've literally never played 5e. And now if I play it, then I break my streak. And it's like, oh, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Well, it's like, uh, uh, it's like um, people talk about McDonald's stuff. Like, Elite Eight Showdown, they just had an episode about the best uh, discontinued item from McDonald's and I was listening to it just cause gotcha. I listened to it and I was like, I've never eaten a single one of these things <laughs> cause I don't, mm -mm. I haven't eaten McDonald's in years other than last week. We, um, we got a couple shamrock Oreo flurries or something for Tim to put oh, into yeah, like yeah, a, yeah. a cake and like, yeah, yeah, that was the first time I'd had anything McDonald's in, in years. A shamrock shake cake. So it was, that seems um, like heresy, but. it's like a, what do you call it? Angel food cake? In, in, what do they call it? Is it angel food cake? Is that the word? Yeah. Um, the he takes fluff, that, white cake. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, he cuts it like in half and puts it back in a cake pan. And then he puts some of the, the, a pound cake. Oh, he is here. Okay. Pound, yeah. Pound cake. And then some of that, yeah. um, shamrock shake flurry with the Oreo mixed in, um, Something else, I think an ice cream layer and then the pound cake on top and then put it back in the freezer to let it mix together, kind of, or freeze together. Um, we had that for uh, Lindsay's birthday, tiny celebration. Um, and it was good. It was really good. I liked it a lot. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Still uh, heresy, but nice. <laughs> Uh, but I did say we're going to talk about the d some of the derived gods. We got totally off topic there. Whew. Oh, God. That was, that was a... <laughs> That was a bit of a, a rabbit hole there. That was a ride. Um, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the derived gods. That that's all theory. That's all theory. Hammer. There's no. I haven't seen anything. Um, that was like, uh, uh, what's the word? Official about things like the horned mm -hmm. rat, the Skaven god, the great horned rat, where he's often sure. seen as a amal amalgamation of Nurgle and Zinch together, where the the Skaven don't really worship the Great Horned Rat. They worship aspects of Nurgle and Zinch. But because of the way the gods and things work in the Warhammer world, it has become an actual god itself. Sure. But it's like it's a little bit from through Zinch their belief. put together. Um, which I, I I like that idea a lot. I think it's perfect. It fits. Like, the Skaven are obviously creatures of chaos. So the fact that they worship mm -hmm. something... That's well, there, there's them. even, you know, uh, what Cain, who's the god of murder, which is kind of a almost like a Slanesh and corn combo, you know, the whole idea of excess, yes, and you know, wrath and murder or whatnot. So, which is yeah, a cool it's one, it's almost like there's certain, yeah, yeah, you know, there's each of like the smaller kind of peripheral gods are, are kind of aspects of to, of the bigger picture, you know, they yep. kind of take on aspects or a couple of them together. Well, even with Cain, there's a little, maybe a little, there's maybe a little bit of Zinch in there. Yeah. Cause it's like murder is like kind of a change thing. Obviously they're changing from li alive to dead. <laughs> that was one I'd you know, forgotten but... about. That's a good one to mention Cain. Um, another one that we yeah. see often is actually Gork and Mork, the orc gods. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people see them as a map uh, because they're brutal, but cunning and cunning, but brutal. We got some corn and zinch going on there. I just did yeah. Taylor. He just said, when do we talk about the best gods, Gork and Mork? <laughs> I just said it. <laughs> I know the chat's on a little right. bit of a, a delay. Um, also, Tim says that uh, I, apparently I mildly complimented him last week. So he said he needs to be here to make sure that to confirm things like that don't repeat themselves. I don't remember what it was that I said, but, you know, <laughs> sure, you're welcome. Uh, what was the other one? Um, Gork and Mork. Kane, Kane's Gork a really Kane. good one. Um, and then we have things Horn like rat. minor chaos gods as well, other than the big four. Uh, earlier in the chat, Taylor mentioned Malal, who's mm. one that well, is... We don't wasn't that uh, like a copyright issue that like he got deleted not because he's not still part of the universe technically, but because of the way the contract was drawn up over 
so like the original author retained rights, which would allow him to get royalties. And so instead of pay out royalties, Games Workshop just cut that god out, out that of their canon. Hundred percent sounds like something GW would do. That I feel like I've read that before as well. So there's there's very little about Malau. It goes way back to mm-hmm. like what eighties and early nineties, maybe. Um, well, it's in the the original uh, first edition book. It's listed as one of the gods of chaos, and then I think he was maybe mentioned a little bit in. Um, white dwarf and i believe there was like one novel that had him in it and then at, and then at that point this copyright issue kind of came up Man. and the author was like where's my royalties and <laughs> came work shots like what are you talking about and then he showed him the contract and they're like all right well you're out then <laughs> we're just not going to use that one anymore then we don't want to give you money that's too eh, bad we're done yeah i think my so, favorite yeah, it's unfortunate because it's he's a it's a cool god but uh yeah it's not canon anymore yeah that's what i need to i don't know part of me wants to say i should look into that some more but like if he's not in the game anymore then yeah why he he hasn't been in it since like early first edition you know due to that copyright issue so and that was a long written out before my time yeah one time (laughs) uh probably my favorite of the minor chaos gods is hashit what the chaos dwarves worship, which is basically a big bull, uh, is it uh, is it Lamash too? Is that a? I think I'm getting. That's the mother of monsters. No, yeah, I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm getting Pathfinder gods mixed in there. Uh, but he looks <laughs> like a, a a Lamasu, I think is what it's called, a bull with wings. Instead uh, of like a unicorn, or instead of like a Pegasus, it's a, a specifically a bull, and they're usually I big and Gorgon, red. But that's different. Hmm? I want to say a Gorgon, but that, that doesn't have wings. That's like the metal. Bullet. And that's dependent on what games, like what world you're talking about. I got to look this up now because it's driving me crazy. Uh, I think it's a Lamassu. Because it's from like um, like Persian folklore. Uh, yeah, there we go. So it's a, it's a bull's body, sometimes with wings, um, that typically has like a human face. So it was, um, mm. Hashut is the Chaos Dwarf god that they worship um as their their lord of chaos and typically so like the face of a, a lamasu has like a chaos dwarf face with their big like uh curly beards and then it's a bull body uh, usually red and then they have big like bat wings like they look so cool um i should have brought a head of picture of that ready but if you don't um if you're not familiar with the chaos dwarves we can do a whole episode on in the future look up a, a chaos dwarf lamasu because they are uh pretty cool looking i just love the idea uh, of hashit is cool he's like um as the chaos dwarf god he's a lot about like lava and ash and whatnot chaos dwarf magic is like lava magic which is really cool um and they have like bull centaurs which are like chaos dwarf body with bull well okay so the centaur but the human parts of chaos dwarf and the horse parts of bull (laughs) sure they look so cool. I love those guys. Um, Bastion also that mentioned awesome. Hashter, which sounds a lot that, like Hasha, but that, that does sound familiar, but I don't know what that one is. So maybe he can fill us in on that a little bit, unless he was thinking Hashut and just messed up the spelling a little bit, or if it's something different. I'm not going to... Well, it is interesting. Like, uh, one of the videos, I think I referenced it last week also, uh, they were talking about how, like, the warp, which uh, which houses all of, you know, the chaos gods and all, but there's also the this notion that the the law gods and and even like, uh, you know, the lesser gods, Cain and uh, the horned rat, all these things like sort of have their own little dominion in the warp, and so like technically like Sigmar is is uh, embodied in the warp and all the law gods, like all these things. Basically, that all you have to do is believe strongly enough, and they sort of pop into existence in the warp and like become an actual entity. But they all sort of idea. are right there next to each other. Yeah, which seems really cool. It makes it makes perfect sense in that setting with the idea of these chaos gods in their own realm already, and the idea of the warp being like this alternate dimension that influences the Warhammer world. I love that idea that they all have their own little pocket areas there including the, the gods of order 
um, which just aren't as... Right. Well, I guess they, I was going to say aren't as active on the world as the chaos gods, but you can have priests that enact miracles directly from those gods, so they're, they're around too. Sure. I think it's it's more uh, that, like, um, the chaos gods sort of... They draw more direct worship of, like, their followers. It's, like, more fervent and, you know, more, uh, like, uh, you know... Whereas like the the law gods, it's more ordered. There's churches and a hierarchy and thing where it's like more structured. Whereas the chaos gods just draw directly on like the pure emotional sort of uh, energy of human beings, which is like maybe stronger, and so they're like more present than some of these more structured gods or, or lesser known. I don't know. I think a lot of it too with the chaos gods is that they are like ways to worship them can be kind of vague like you don't have to overtly worship the chaos gods to give them power whereas the the law mm-hmm. the gods of order like being a god of order you do so like going to war right. doesn't necessarily indirectly worship ulrich even though he's a god of war unless you're like for ulrich but if you're going to right. war no matter what you're fighting about you are indirectly worshiping corn sure so i think that's why the chaos yeah, gods at least giving him influence, you know? Yeah. So I feel like, in a way, that the four chaos gods are more powerful than the gods of order because of that. And But mm-hmm. their infighting keeps them in check. <laughs> right. Yeah, luckily, you know, the because they are so kind of chaotic and, and, uh, and not ordered, uh, that conflict with, among each other keeps them from ever, like, really truly attaining any kind of true power. For sure. So, and that I love that repeating motif throughout the Warhammer world. Like, the different clans of the Skaven, if they didn't fight amongst each other, they would have taken over the Empire a long time ago. The different uh, clans of the Orcs, if they didn't fight each other, they're just there's so many of them, mm-hmm. they would have taken over. And we see this repeating a lot with, like, the bad guys of the Warhammer world, where if they were actually to unite, they would be unstoppable. Sure. Which... Yeah, absolutely. Good thing, good thing they fight each other. Right. Well, I All think right. That, that kind of brings a little mm-hmm. bit of balance to the to the system. It yes. kind of makes things more balanced too, because you know, if if it was all the chaos gods just pouring, you know, in, against humanity, it would. I mean, that's sort of where you get that uh, uh, the end times basically is where it's just like, okay, well, chaos wins. You know, wash your mouth out with soap. Which 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 we don't we don't talk about that. Yes. The end times, hypothetically, if it were to ever ha- actually happen in the Warhammer world. Yeah. <laughs> As a thought experiment. Right? Talk about, uh, <laughs> talk about shitting on additions. Uh, <laughs> we just pretend the end times didn't happen as as fans. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but I feel like that, I feel like we, we, we did it. A little over an hour, because we so. started a tiny bit late. Um I feel like we, we covered the basics of chaos. Um, so I think future episodes we can go more in depth about the different gods and talk about the different demons. Um, I forgot I was going to mention Beasts of Nurgle when we're talking about Nurgle, but, you know, Nurgle's puppies. Mm-hmm. We'll save that for future. <laughs> yeah, for sure. There's so much in each individual god to, to cover. There's so much detail. and, and Right. Uh, and we could talk and, about different figures yeah. throughout the lore that have been worshippers of these different gods and whatnot and the different cults and everything. So that'll be for the future, mm-hmm. though. Um, I got to double check my schedules if I even planned past this way back when I first started writing up ideas for this of what next week should be. Oh, I have high elves as the next topic. Because yeah. uh, I think it... Er, episode five or six or something like that was elves where I talked about the three kinds of elves and their differences a little bit. And I said, in the future, I'll go over each type of elf in more detail. So next (laughs) will be high elves. Uh, Throw lash Taylor in the chat just said gross (laughs) with all caps (laughs) as a a regular opponent in the fantasy game. He hates high elves. Um, But yeah, that'll be next week. Uh, Let's see. I'm going to talk about last week. We, we kind of, we was like, Oh, we're out of time. Oh, cause I had, actual real life things to do uh didn't get a chance to go right. over the weekly schedule which i know dagna is, here is very uh intimately familiar with because i think you um <laughs> take part in, in listen to everything we put out pretty much <laughs> I, 
think so. I think uh, heavily yeah. involved. I know you were mentioned up the uh, the super fan status. I was just going to say that the most recent uh, Elite Eight Showdown, you were you were mentioned as a yeah. super fan. <laughs> um, uh, I got my uh, my review on air, so that's cool. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> if you like two guys, you'll like this podcast. <laughs> or if you don't like two guys, it's good. Right, you'll still like it because they don't like yeah. each other. That's not true, but they yell at each other a lot. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so other than here, Sundays, uh, obviously, uh, two weeks later, the stream video goes up on YouTube at midnight, um, so you can always catch up there. Uh, we were talking a lot about Chaos, talking about Chaos Undivided. If you want to hear more about the the ultimate uh, representation of Chaos Undivided, the, the first Demon Prince ever, Bellacor, or Balakor, however you want to say it, uh, check out my episode about Albion, where he has a lot to do with things there um, that is on YouTube. Um, so then Mondays to start the, after, you know, this starts the week really tight. If you look at the calendar, it starts on Sunday, but most people think of the week starting on Monday. You can start off with the Lost Omens podcast I mentioned earlier, which is Danny is, uh, the DM playing, uh, we're playing Pathfinder second edition. She's running us through the Extinction Curse adventure path. <laughs> it is so much fun. Every time we record, my face yeah. hurts 10 minutes in from laughing so much. It's the funniest show. <laughs> we've, we've got a it's, great crew. it's a great it's a great uh playthrough I, i've i've listened to two others partially uh of other podcasts and i'd say by far this is the most different and probably the most entertaining for sure. nice that that's nice to hear thank you <laughs> yeah we're trying to get the word out on that um just because Pathfinder, there, there's just a lot more competition out there for to get people's listening time. Um, and when we first started doing it, Extinction Curse, there there wasn't anybody else running in that at the time. I know there's at least three or four other groups that are running that same AP. But, you know, come to ours for the personality. Because our role play, sure. I think, around the table is fantastic. And it's just, I think we've got way more chemistry than other groups. Um, not to call well, anybody a, out. Uh, I don't know if it's just uh, just personality wise of the players, but there seems to be a lot more creative problem solving in your guys playthrough than the others. The others, it's like, oh, there's something that looks like an enemy, so let's go kill it. Where I know in uh, in your guys playthrough, there's been a lot of conversion of uh, come of, work uh, at our circus. Tech, yeah, technical enemies, but have been converted over to be allies, which is really kind of cool. Yeah, we, we really wanted to focus on the the characters in that and not just make it every episode is about the combat feats that we took. It's Pathfinder, so obviously there's a lot of that, but but yeah, we tried to to play it, you know, the, the way we want to play it. So we're going to play it. Yeah. Um Tim Tim just said in the chat, recruit, 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 right? We're trying to build up our circus and get get more acts cuz not even all of our characters have acts, especially mine. Uh, he doesn't do X because he's slightly agoraphobic and doesn't like big crowds, so he works the books in the back. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then Monday nights, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, on here on our Twitch, twitch.tv slash professional casual network. If you're watching this on the YouTube, we have, oh yeah, the power phase, where we play Marvel Crisis Protocol. Uh, my favorite miniatures game. It's the only one I play right now. Uh, I think it's the best one out there. Uh, even if you don't like Marvel, I think it's just a great time. We have a lot of fun with it. We we're getting better at the rules. Luckily, we've got a, a regular um, who play who plays at a high level regularly. He helps us with the rules a lot. The war gaming dad um, is awesome, and it's just it's a super fun time. Uh, we're going to be doing Civil War the next few weeks, where we're going to be specifically playing missions that AMG recently released to to kind of theme the games that way. Um, one person will represent registration side, and one person will represent the renegades that are anti-registration. Really looking forward to that. Tuesdays, uh, for a long time, we're kind of the, eh, it's Tuesday kind of days, but we uh, have a new, um, a Charlie Big Chuck has uh, trademarked a new term called a pavlog, <laughs> because uh, we have, wait, did I roll a wild? Uh, where we talk about all things MCP, um, and f mostly we focus on, uh, the, the news from the previous week, look at new cards that have been revealed and new characters, um, and things like that, and just kind of chat and take, give our opinions on things. Sometimes they're very, uh, 
heated opinions <laughs> um, that comes out on YouTube on Tuesdays and also a podcast version, um, which is why we call it a pavlog, because it's not just a vlog, it's also a podcast. Uh, Wednesdays is our Patreon day, where we have all kinds of extra Patreon content, um, which is awesome. At all of our shows, the video is on Patreon as well. Um, it was a Lost Omens, uh, Grim Podcast, Perils Adventure, uh, Lee A Showdown. I was like, what's the third one? The name just left my head. Uh, you can get all those videos on on the Patreon, but Wednesdays we have bonus content come out. Ch uh, Big Chuck's got his Big Chuck and Vlog. Occasionally, Danny does book reviews regularly. The podcast version of this stream goes up on Wednesdays, and in the near future, uh, looking like next month, we're hoping, will be the Patreon-exclusive uh, podcast and video, uh, The Settling the Southlands, our um, homebrewed Warhammer Fantasy roleplay actual play where a new group of adventurers is going to the Southlands to try to establish an Imperial colony, which has been a blast so far. So much fun recording that. Um, can't wait for that to come out. Uh, Dagna here helped. Uh, he created a, a little group of NPCs that they have interacted with. Give you a shout out there. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then, that. yeah, Thursdays, we have a grim podcast of Perilous Adventure. Uh, you know, don't tell anybody about my favorite show on the network where uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, we play, you know, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, as we're talking about a lot here. And I'm running the group through The Enemy Within, and it has been just the best time. Uh, we are currently in Death on the Reich, the second book of the campaign. And uh, I don't know. It, I, I just, I think it's great, but I'm running it. <laughs> no, it's, it's by far... You know, not to gush or anything as a super fan, but uh, by far the best, <laughs> by far the best uh, playthrough I've ever experienced of uh, the enemy within. So, All right, thanks. I'm working Highly on trying. Recommend. Hmm. Highly recommend it. Yeah, great. Uh, I've been working on trying to, to convince people that don't necessarily know Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay to give it a shot. Because uh, I feel like with the quality of the show, we could swing with the big boys out there. Um, it doesn't have to be D&D or Pathfinder, I think. It, it's it's good role-playing. It doesn't matter what the system is. So you know, Yeah, you don't have to, to say, know anything about Warhammer or the system to enjoy it at all. It's Right, Tim didn't when we first started, so... It's still questionable whether he does or not now. But. <laughs> uh, he knows the rules pretty well. He saved, saved some things in combat recently, which has been nice. Um, <laughs> Tim tried to say the same thing in chat, and then I think we said it before it popped up. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like, not just because I run the game, but I really feel like the, the quality of it has become this, the... The same or even better than some of the the big names out there in terms of actual plays. Um, so we used to say at the end of Big Fiction Energy, the first podcast, you know, tell your friends, tell your mom, tell your friend's mom, spread the word. Fridays, we've got Elite Eight Showdown with Big Chuck and Tim, where they go over an eight subject bracket about who knows what it could be week to week. Um, and they argue about things and they debate topics and often... They, uh, depending on what gets brought up, they might yell at each other about stuff for 20 minutes, which to me is just funny. Uh, when Chuck oh, yeah, went on a tirade times. about superhero shows on the CW, when Tim, um, alluded to them being not the highest quality television, that was, that was some golden, that was some golden content right. there. Tim says they attack each other personally. True. Definite threat of, uh, bloodshed as well, if you watch the video. It's a good thing they sit across the table from each other when they when they record that show. Uh, it, it's a good time. Not a show to listen to with kids, uh, but not family friendly, but a good time. Uh, I listen every week, even though I, usually I, I wait until they, they start giving me crap, and then I smile and nod and say, there it is, and then keep going. Um, which lately, you've been a target here and there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, figured, I put myself on the map, so I, I did it to myself, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, and then, of course, the video for that is also on the Patreon Fridays when it goes up. Whew! It's a busy week every week here at the Professional Casual Network. Uh, thank you so much again for joining me, Adam. I'm sure uh, I'll drag you back on here someday in the future. 
Next week, I'll be to. talking about high elves. So I know Taylor will, will show up just to uh, argue with every point I have. <laughs> Otherwise, thanks again. And thanks, everybody, watching and listening. Uh, if you haven't yet, check out our Patreon.com slash Professional Casual or ProfessionalCasual.com to see all the other things that we have. Um, joining our Discord uh, is worth it for the money alone. Uh, you, sure. As we've been talking here, I have, you know, I've, I've, we've gotten messages and things I need to catch up on. <laughs> it's a great time. Uh, awesome nerd community of 100% positive. We've got no trolls. We've got no toxic anything in there. It's a great time. Great. The best <laughs> Discord uh, online. Oh, I forgot. Uh, Danny had asked a question. I wanted. To, I know I was I kind of doing a goodbye there. Uh, but Danny did ask, what is Dagna making for the first PCN Con barbecue? Well, I've already promised uh, my uh, homemade tortillas, so Ooh. I guess probably something, probably something around there. Maybe some carnitas, maybe a little barbacoa. Oh, that you know, sounds something fantastic. to go in a tortilla. Ryan, you are a chef, right? Yeah, full, uh, fully. Like, uh, I mean, I went to a Le Cordon Bleu uh, cooking school, so I have a classically trained French technique. Uh, wow, I mean so, that yeah, sounds I'm, fancy. So yeah, I don't know I've about it specifically. Uh, <laughs> I've done a lot of uh, fine dining. Uh, I just it, it's terrible for lifestyle, so I don't do it anymore. <laughs> oh no! Well, how many Michelin but, uh, stars do you have? <laughs> oh, no. Well, the the <laughs> the place I did my internship at at the time had three. So whoa! Yeah. I know a little tiny yeah. bit about that from Gordon Ramsay shows I used to watch. So yeah. awesome! I did my internship at the French Laundry, which anybody who knows anything about food that's like on their on their radar. So. You say the French uh, Laundry? Yeah, it's in Yountville, which is just north of Napa. And uh, Thomas Keller is the chef there, and he's uh, world-renowned. He was the only chef in the world to have two restaurants in the top five best restaurants in the world at the same time. So, wow. You know, I'm give you a kind of a, <laughs> kind of a big deal. Uh, ultimately, it was only an internship, but uh, I probably learned more there than I did in, uh, you know, two years at culinary school so wow it was a great experience that's awesome yeah uh, i just yeah. want to let you know that tim is freaking out in the chat all caps yelling please yes barbacoa and homemade tortillas yes or carnitas he loves that stuff so <laughs> we got to get this barbecue for happening tim, for tim i'll do both Ooh. um so we need to we need to get this uh this covid problem solved so we can actually have our uh pc and barbecue Everybody sure. save My in. We're 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 going. So yeah, everybody save your stimulus checks for those plane tickets to come here. <laughs> right. Oh, he just put a whole bunch of exclamation points. <laughs> nice. So yeah, join our join our uh, our community, and someday we'll have some kind of VIP event like that. Um, in someday in the future, we'd love to to go to cons. Uh, once those start up again, uh, representing the PCN and our actual plays and everything, and and all that. Um, other than that, I, once more, since we're finally signing off here, thank you once again, Adam. <laughs> Absolutely, my pleasure. Hopefully you'll be able to come back in the future. Thank you, everybody listening and watching. Whatever your method for that is on the Patreon with the podcast or on YouTube, uh, check us out live Sunday afternoons. Otherwise, I'll say uh, thanks one more time and uh, keep gaming. Bye.